Hi, welcome back to my channel, and today I'm counting down my 10 best 2000 AD comic strips. I've loved 2000 AD for the longest time. I got the very first issue when I was about five or six years old, and I sort of read it intermittently from that point onwards, and then I started subscribing to it from about 1980-81. Um, I had a very uh, dodgy news agent in my village, and you can never uh, rely on him to deliver it. But I kind of basically read it all the way through to the end of 84, round about the end of the Apocalypse War in Judge Dredd. And then I sort of went off it for a bit and I came back in the late 80s um, when it was doing things like Zenith and uh, new strips like Bad Company. And I read it up until about 1990. And then I felt it was going up its own arse a bit, you know. It had been too much influenced by the graphic novel, the rise of the graphic novel. And I found the strips lost their sense of fun and spontaneity and I stopped reading it. So this is a very old school list of 2000 AD strips. Um, it's going back about 30 years actually. But I think that 2000 AD has been a fantastic addition to science fiction in this country. Now at number 10, because this is a bit of an old school list, is a strip that perhaps I'm the only person who would pick this. It's a strip called Black Hawk. Uh, which I really loved back in the early 80s, but it's kind of forgotten now. And it's about this Nubian warrior in the time of the Romans, and he's a gladiator in the arena, and suddenly he finds himself whisked onto this alien spaceship where they have gladiatorial battles uh, between different alien creatures, and he's uh, being forced into fighting these monsters and aliens. It was a fairly simple storyline. I think what I most liked about it was the fantastic artwork by... Massimo Belladonelli, this Italian uh, artist who worked on 2000 AD in its early days. He'd done a lot of the artwork for the Dan Dare strip, for which he'd created many great aliens. He was really good at creating aliens and monsters, Massimo. And um, some of the creatures he came up with and some of the uh, strips that he came up with for Black Hawk were absolutely fantastic. And I think that's the principal reason why I enjoyed it. And it was probably my favourite fantasy strip of 2000 AD. I know many people will be upset with me. I have not included Slain on this list. Even though it was based on Celtic mythology, which I loved as a child. But I never really liked the character of Slain. I loved the world it was in, and I loved the uh, artwork. But I didn't really like the character. And also I prefer the sort of science fiction-y strips. So Black Hawk is my number ten. And it's now available. They've collected it together in a volume. At number nine is Sam Slade, Robo Hunter. This is probably my fav uh, favourite of the more sort of humorous 2000 AD comic strips. It's a kind of piss take of the film noir private eye genre. You know, there's this sort of, uh, you know, smooth talking guy and he has a talking cigar, you know, and he, he solves uh, cases to do with uh, corrupt or malevolent robots. It's very silly. It's wonderfully drawn by Ian Gibson, who was one of my favourite artists on 2000 AD. And uh, what 2000 AD used to do, it used to go through the American genres, the American film genres, and do a sort of science fiction pastiche of them. And uh, this is a pastiche of film noir and uh, private detective movies. And it's great fun, and I really enjoy it. Eighth place is Harlem Heroes. Now... Back in the 1970s, the Harlem Globetrotters were a very famous uh, basketball team in America. They're from New York, and they used to do exhibition matches and stuff. And Harlem Heroes is <laughs> absolutely outrageous steel, right? And it puts them in the near future, where basketball has transformed into this game where you play it with jetpacks in this huge arena, and you have to throw this steel ball into this collection zone. And, you know, anything is allowed. Kung fu, you know, cage fighting, any kind of extreme violence <clears throat> to win the game is allowed. And the main villain of this uh, story was Artie Gruber, who's this <laughs> ex-player who's got a vengeance, who had a terrible accident, and now looks like some kind of zombie <laughs> with a skeleton face. It's so over the top. Um, and it transformed Harlem Heroes into another strip called Inferno, which was outrageously violent. So violent that it got to the comic a lot of criticism. It was very over the top. Also drawn by Belladonelli. Though the original artwork on Harlem Heroes, brilliant artwork, was by Dave Gibbons. Um, future Sport was a kind of genre in 2000 AD. And it they kept trying different variations of it that not 
terribly successful. Later on, they came up with a brilliant idea called the Mean Arena, which was based on um, the way football started in medieval villages in England. So one side of the village would, would you know, be one team, and the other side of the village would be the other team, and they had to get the ball to the other side of the village. And Mean Arena is a, an adaptation of that idea, so they had to get, the team has to get this ball through this disused part of a city, this industrial area of a city that's been made homeless. Great idea. Unfortunately, the strip itself was a bit boring and didn't really come off. It was a terrific idea. So Harlem Heroes is my favourite of the Future Sports strips. Now, at number seven is Flesh. Now, this was one of the very first strips in 2000 AD, and I absolutely loved it. But I must admit, I loved it more in the concept rather than the realisation. The concept is so brilliant. The idea is that in the future, there's so many people in the world that we've run out of food. But then they devise time travel. And they go back in time to prehistoric age. And they start hunting dinosaurs and farming dinosaurs. And the era of the cowboy is revived. They start these ranches out in prehistoric earth and they're, they're corralling dinosaurs. There's so much that could have been done with that idea. They could have made this brilliant combination of the Western and the dinosaur movie. And they could have had a Western saga with two competing ranch, ranches, you know, at loggerheads with each other, with, with um, dinosaurs instead of cattle. Pat Mills, who devised the strip, went down a much more simple route, I think, where he went down a route where it was man versus nature. And the dinosaurs eventually turn on the humans in the form of... Uh, Old uh, One Eye, Old One Eye, this old mother Tyrannosaurus Rex, which provides for a great, uh, exciting adventure. But I just think there's so much more that could have been done with the idea. And also, you know, just think about this: 2000 AD started in 1978 and was at the peak of its popularity throughout the 1980s. During that time, not a single British film producer decided to make one of these stories into a film. That just shows how shit the British film industry is. They have these fantastic series of properties coming from this one comic, and they didn't make a single movie from them. We had to wait till that dreadful Sylvester Stallone Judge Dredd pick in 1996, or whenever it was. And just think about this. You know, a Western, with all those old Western actors still alive, Clint Eastwood, Tommy Lee Jones, Jeff Bridges, Warren Oates, they could have played these fantastic grizzled old cowboys with, you know, years before Jurassic Park, and they didn't do it. It would have made such a fantastic movie. In sixth place is Strontium Dog. Now, I know many people would place this higher. I remember Strontium Dog starting in Star-Lord magazine. Star-Lord magazine has never been cred given credit, I think, for how much it fed 2000 AD in the 1980s. I remember it starting in colour with Carlos Ezcaro's Beautiful artwork. Again, it's a Western in space, really. That's what it is. It's bounty hunters, right? So, and, it, and Carlos Escobar gave it a true Western feel. And I love Westerns. I think I should have loved Strontium Dog more than I did. I often found the stories a bit disappointing. I don't think they made the most of the scenario. It was a brilliant scenario. Great central characters. Great look about it. I sometimes felt that the realisation of the strip wasn't quite as good as its idea, personally, but still one of the best strips to grace 2000 AD. At number five, Robusters. A oh, bit of a nostalgic, guilty pleasure choice, this, but I loved Robusters. What, again, from Star Lord magazine, people forget this. What a great strip this was. What a great idea to take Thunderbirds and do it with robots. That's it. And, you know, and the two robots, Hammerstein and Rojaws, great creations, beautifully drawn, immediately likeable, kind of Laurel and Hardy characters, with this boss who has a telephone in his head. Later on, Hammerstein and Rojaws were made more serious characters. They were put into ABC Warriors, which is not on this list, actually, um, partly because I only really like the first two books of ABC Warriors. The first two books are terrific. The ABC Warriors are these robots who are... Um, they're recruited to do this war on Mars. And um, very, very well-drawn, very engaging strip in its first two books. After that, it got combined with Nemesis, and I, I lost interest in it a bit. It got a bit too self-important. And I always preferred Hammerstein and Rojo's as comic characters, really. Robusters is a lot of fun. 
And um, it's, I think it's telling that these two characters have stayed with the history of 2000 AD. In fourth place is Nemesis the Warlock. Now, Nemesis the Warlock, I think, is one of the most original strips 2000 AD ever did. But I will be honest, my main love of it comes from Kevin O'Neill's amazing artwork. Kevin O'Neill, of course, who died, sadly, I think last week or the week before. What an incredible artist he was. His artwork on this strip is amazingly original and weird, kind of like this twisted gothic. No character in comic fiction looks like Nemesis, or looks like his ship, the Blitzspear, with its kind of engine that looks like a sort of gnashing teeth. Um, <clears throat> the strip has got a brilliant but very simple idea that in the future, um, the Earth is run by this kind of new Spanish Inquisition, and what they're trying to ferret out of the planet Earth is aliens. So it's a big sort of metaphor of racism, right? And Nemesis is an alien who's trying to stop this crusade. And um, Torquemada, is, his, his, his opponent, is a brilliant character, very funny black comic character uh, with that wonderful you know, catchphrase, be vigilant, behave. And of course later on he becomes an alien himself and he's desperately trying to hide the fact that he's an alien. Um, an amazingly original, wondrous, different kind of comic strip. Very, very worth finding out if you've never watched it before. Number three, Bad Company. This is the one strip that I fell in love with in late 80s, 2000 and matched my affection for previous strips. I think it's an extraordinary strip. Now, what 2000 used to do a lot was future war stories. They were the most popular genre. And all of these future war stories in 2000 AD are based on a kind of subgenre of American cinema called Lost Platoon movies. These are often set in the Korean War, they were from the 1950s or 60s, where some platoon gets disengaged from the army and has to fight its way through enemy terrain. And the most popular version of this in 2000 AD is Rogue Trooper. Rogue Trooper doesn't fe feature on this list, another very popular strip. I love the look of Rogue Trooper. I love that, you know, the appearance of him and that brilliant idea that his dead comrades are in chips and his rifle and in his helmet. I think that's ingenious. Um, but the stories bored me. I think the original set of Rogue Trooper stories were written by Jerry Finlay Day, who was an old trooper he'd written in the action comics in the 70s. And they didn't have the tang of Pat Mills and John Wagner and Alan Grant, you know, that sort of special 2000 AD spice. So I didn't enjoy Rogue Troopers so much. But Bad Company, uh, which came along in the late 80s, is a really remarkable version of the Lost Platoon story. Brilliantly drawn by Brett Ewins, wonderfully created characters by Brett Ewins. And it's about this uh, group of renegades, this renegade uh, group of troops who've fallen out of their various platoons or deserted and have now come together in this band. And the Earth is at war with these weird creatures called the Cruel who have this kind of telepathic link. And it's clear that what they've done with Bad Company is they've updated the Lost Platoon story to Vietnam. It's 2000 AD's version of a Vietnam story, right? And the cruel are kind of like the Viet Cong, this kind of hidden, invisible enemy that all seem to act as one, right? And the strip has a kind of weird, psychedelic, acid feel about it, rather like Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now. And I just absolutely fell in love with the artwork and the weird atmosphere and the brilliant ending of it, which is very unexpected, which I won't spoil. If you've never read Bad Company, do find it. It's absolutely terrific. Now we get to our top two. At number two, The Ballad of Halo Jones. I cannot tell you how much impact this strip had on me when I first read it at the age of about 12 years old. I think it came out in about 84. I thought it was fantastic. Um, it was a brilliant match of Alan Moore as writer and Ian Gibson as artist, who was the perfect artist for it, about this young girl, young teenage girl, growing up in this uh, overcrowded earth of the future, who just wants to get out. That was the, uh, the byline of it, was where did she go out? What did she do? Everything, which was great, you know. And... Um, I loved the strip. I'd, I had previously discovered Alan Moore because I think V for Vendetta 
had originally been serialised in Warrior magazine, if anyone out there remembers that. I remember it very well. And I loved Beef for Vendetta. But I think Ballad of Halo Jones is the great unsung masterpiece of Alan Moore's career. It's a very good portrait of young adolescents' rite of passage in this brilliantly drawn science fiction world. I loved the second book, where she becomes this waitress on a sort of, you know, uh, universe-going cruise liner. And uh, she has this metal dog that is, uh, gets very jealous of anyone who comes near her. And there's this brilliant character called No One, who is this character who, um, I don't know what people would make of it these days, but she's gone through various sex and identity changes to the point where she's not got any distinguishing identity features at all. So she actually disappears below the threshold of consciousness, so no one can actually see her. She can hang around and you don't even know she's there. It's a brilliant black comic joke on identity. I don't know how it would fly these days. And um, that character is brilliantly threaded through the narrative in that second book. And in the third book, Halo Jones goes to war, and that's beautifully done. I think Ballad of Halo Jones is really special. Why has that not been made into a film? Anyway, number one, and you know what I'm going to pick, Judge Dredd, the man from Mega City One. I fell in love with Judge Dredd straight away, from the Mike McMahon days, Carlos Ezkera, all those wonderful artists who drew, who drew it and brought something new to it, from Brian Bolland, um, Ron Smith, very underrated artist of the Judge Dredd saga. Almost every artist who's contributed to Judge Dredd has brought something to it. But the scripts by Wagner and Grant and... Mills are just fantastic. What a brilliant black comedy. So again, going back to this idea <coughs> of taking different American genres, Judge Dredd is obviously Dirty Harry, right? But it's Dirty Harry taken to a gloriously ridiculous extreme where Dirty Harry can go out on the streets and he's judge, jury and execution. He can shoot whoever he wants, do whatever he wants, and everybody in his eyes is a criminal. The beauty of Judge Dredd is that there are only the judges and there are only the people. There's nothing else and everyone is a criminal. And the more blackly humorous and more fascistic Judge Dredd is, the better it is as a strip, I think. Uh, I mean, I love all the various stories, like the Dark Judges and the Apocalypse War and the Cursed Earth and the Judge Child. I love all that stuff. But actually, I really preferred Judge Dredd when it was down-to-earth, everyday business of the judges, showing this, uh, this sort of macabre world of Mega City One, you know, like Sob Story and Otto Sump and people making themselves ugly because it becomes a fashion. All that kind of thing really amused me. And I, thought, I think the highest point of Judge Dredd is between the Cursed Earth and the end of the Apocalypse War. I think that's, for me, the best period of Judge Dredd. But it's a fantastic strip. It never grows old, Judge Dredd. It never grows old. The world building of Mega City One is fascinating. And it's a brilliant satire of America. It's a brilliant satire of crime and law and order and it's a brilliant pastiche of Dirty Harry and it's my favourite 2000 AD strip. I apologise to those people, I didn't include Slane and Rogue Trooper or the ABC Warriors, I'm very sorry about that and I didn't include any of the more modern strips that are very popular like Durham Red for example but please tell me below what your favourite uh, top 10 2000 AD strips are. Is there any I've missed out? From that period, that early period, was there any missed out? I'd like to know. And if you like the content of this video, please like and subscribe. Thanks very much.